go for uh, live. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyil ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa tabi'in lahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Distinguished guest, uh, lecturers, professionals, students, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, welcome back to this platform of Islamic Economics Association uh, in the Faculty of Sharia and Islamic Studies, Kuwait University. And today we are going to start a two days workshop, I mean, training on Islamic banks, products, and services. And as you know, we do have two uh, uh, very skilled and uh, uh, professional trainers and instructors, who is one Dr. Sharif, Muhammad Sharif, and another one is Dr. Muhammad Farooq Abdullah. And we do have uh, every day, I mean, two day, two sessions, morning session, uh, which is going to start just now. And another session is uh, evening session uh, will be conducted by Dr. Uh, Muhammad Farooq Abdullah. So uh, be before we begin uh, our uh, workshop, let me introduce our first in in instructor and this uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif Al-Amri. Uh, presently, he is working as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Business and Management Sciences Islamic Economics and Finance Department at Istanbul Sabahuddin Zayim University, uh, Turkey. And Dr. Sharif completed his bachelor's degree in Islamic studies from Ibn Tufail University, Morocco. And he had his master's in Islamic jurisprudence and its principles, uh, while his PhD in Islamic banking and finance from International Islamic University, Malaysia. Dr. Sharif has industrial exposure uh, to and experiences in several Islamic financial institutions uh, internationally. And he is also a member of uh, various international journal, editorial, and also reviewer panel. He has several research publications and presentations in the field of Islamic economics and finance. So today, uh, Without uh, any delay, uh, let me uh, welcome Dr. Muhammad Sharif Al-Amri to conduct the first session of our training on Islamic banks, uh, products and services. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, welcome. Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban bikum. Tafaddal mashkura. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, good morning, everyone. If you have morning, uh, I think I still can. Okay, now I am able to make a comment. Yeah. Good morning to everyone, those who have morning, and maybe some of you have afternoon if you are in uh, Asian side. So I'm pleased to be with you here. Uh, can you see my camera? Yes, yes. Okay, because I as you can see here that okay, it's close. Anyway. So I'm pleased to be with you here uh, for this session and thank you very much uh, to the Islamic Economics Club uh, in the Kuwait University and uh, special thanks also to Dr. Mohiddin and uh, to Sister uh, Dr. Ala al for this uh, kind of uh, great events actually to share knowledge as well as to create awareness on this, uh, uh, in this field, which is still uh, where, I mean, we still need a lot of uh, programs and uh, workshops, conferences and so on to create more awareness among the, uh, especially the Muslims and also the non-Muslims, why not? Because uh, Islamic economics and finance is for Everyone is not only for the Muslims. So I will share my slides. Uh, let me share my slides first with you before I start. Presentation. 
So inshallah, along the way, we will be, um, the floor will be open for you for questions, I think, isn't it, uh, Dr. Mahidin? Or we leave the questions to the last or to the end of the station. What do you suggest? I think the arrangement? The kind of training and workshop, I think if uh, anybody asks any question, maybe you may respond within like maybe after 20 minutes each or half an hour each, no problem. Okay, sure. So or along the way, if anyone has uh, any question, please you can raise your hand and also you can uh, right. ask questions. Uh, Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, uh, it's okay, but you can uh, uh, make it uh, slide mode, in slide okay. mode. Yeah, I think that's better. Yeah, thank you okay. very much. Welcome. So before we start on, I just uh, would like to mention actually that this is uh, kind of uh, basic uh, information that I'm going to share with all of you uh, as per the outline sent to me by the organizer. So if any one of you or some of you may have this kind of background, I'm sorry, uh, if you have uh, knowledge about this, uh, the subject. So therefore I'm just, I would like to tell you this before I, I go forward. So the information which we are going to, uh, inshallah, we, uh, in this presentation, we are going to cover basically the origin of Islamic finance. Uh, we'll talk also about the main features of Islamic finance. We will cover as well the history of the contemporary Islamic finance, and then the Islamic financial services industry, as well as the Islamic banking operations. And lastly, inshallah, we will have an overview over there of the Islamic financial services industry currently. Okay, so before we uh, begin, uh, let's speak about uh, the origin of Islamic finance. So some people, unfortunately, they misunderstand that Islamic finance and they think that Islamic finance just started in the recent uh, 40 uh, or four decades, okay? But actually it has been long actually rooted in our history. So it's not something which is, um, of course, there was kind of, uh, this uh, kind of uh, perception was created because of the disruption that was created by the, basically the colonialists. So we know that basically when the Muslim lands was, uh, were colon uh, colonized by the Western, so the first thing that they basically, of course they have done is that the financial system in the uh, or the Islamic financial system has been uh, definitely destroyed and it has been also replaced by the Western financial system, which we know today, which is um, a riba-based uh, financial system. So therefore, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people actually which think that Islamic finance just started like 40 or 50 years ago, which is not, uh, which is not true. So therefore, we, uh, if we try to look at the, basically, um, the origin of Islamic finance, so we'll find it not only actually uh, back to the time of our Prophet Sallallahu but it is even rooted back to the, because uh, we as a Muslims, we believe that, that Islam is one religion, is the religion of all the prophets of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the messengers of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So therefore, uh, the same uh, values have been introduced actually by all the uh, prophets and messengers it was actually emphasizing on the same principles and same values as we are going to see later, which are shared actually by other even Abrahamic religions. So Islamic finance is based, as we know, on the Sharia. This is what make it... Uh, actually special, okay, uh, from the other uh, basically Islamic uh, or the financial system or the Western financial system. So the value-based uh, legal framework of Islam 
which is extracted basically when we talk about Sharia, which is extracted from the revealed scripture. We know that the sources of Sharia in Islam, we know we get them from Quran first as the main and the primary source, and then from the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu or what we call Sunnah. So this framework basically provides guidelines for people to follow in all aspects of life so that they live in harmony with each other and also with nature and so that they do not encroach on the rights of others and do not also commit injustice towards themselves and or others. So uh, here, when we talk about Islamic finance, we're talking basically about a system which is based on values. So the values and principles exposed by Islamic finance, basically they are universal in nature and their origin also go back uh, long, and even before the advent of Islam, as I have mentioned early. So it is not something which is uh, new or it, uh, refers to 40 or 50 years ago. So these values are shared not only also by uh, all the Abrahamic faiths, but also by other religions. So their adoptions, I mean, the adoptions of these kind of values and principles and implementation contribute towards the formation of sustainable society based on honesty, equitable wealth distribution and social justice. So during the time of the Prophet وسلم, he implemented reforms into the way business was conducted and banished unfair and exploitative practices and based on injunctions derived from basically Quran, which as we have mentioned, it is the primary and the main source of Islamic law or Sharia. So he thus uh, brought back values into business transactions by encouraging people to be fair and just in their dealings and enforcing the sanctity of contracts. So uh, from this introduction, we shall ask, is Islamic finance a new phenomenon? We're talking about the modern Islamic finance. So basically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Islamic finance is not a new invention. So it is in fact a number of concepts and products being used by the modern banks, even the conventional banks. And they have their roots in practices that were prevalent in the Muslim world long before they came to the West. So we can find some of those examples uh, in the practices of the modern banks, like for example, what is it known in Arabic as sak, okay? Which is the origin of the word uh, check, which is uh, very much, uh, or at least it was used a lot, okay? Nowadays we might not use it as much as it was uh, early, few years ago, but it has its origin in the Arabic history, okay? So this kind of check, of course, as we know, it is used to pay for wages and grains uh, delivered to state warehouse by the second Khalif of Islam, uh, Umar ibn Khattab We find also suftaja, which is an instrument combining the features of travels, checks, and letters of credit. It was also used in trade, and it's also used in the modern banking, and it is still used. We have also another concept, <clears throat> which is called Hawala, which is an instrument similar to modern day remittances on credit transfer. We have also Wadi'a or deposit, which is basically until now and heavily all the banks they are depending on actually, which is a service used for safekeeping and deposit, much like it is practiced by the modern banks. And all the banks basically, they are depending on the they are or the deposits which which they have from their depositors. So the advanced state of these practices uh, led Adam Smith to acknowledge the same in his book, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, where he mentioned that among nations of 
shifts a more advanced state of society, such as we find it in among the Tartars and Arabs. So, um, so as we have mentioned, that there are a lot of actually practices which can be uh, in even in the modern conventional banking system, which has been actually borrowed from the applications of those concepts in the Islamic era. Okay, and they have been, or they are still practiced and used until now. Is there any questions so far before we move on? I think uh, not yet, doctor. Okay, so let's move to talk about the main features of Islamic finance, which makes it special. Okay, so the first thing which makes it special is the one that we have mentioned earlier that it is based on Sharia. And when we talk about Sharia, Sharia has set certain basically principles, okay, which Islamic finance must adhere to, which makes it special and different from the other conventional system, okay? So what are the main Sharia principles which govern Islamic finance, basically? So the basically the sustainability and viability of Islamic finance rely on the implementation of some basic principles of the Sharia, as we have mentioned, and Islamic transactions should strictly adhere to the permissible, uh, which is known as halal, and abstain from the prohibited, which is known as haram. So the term halal encompasses everything which is good for the community and does not cause harm. Whereas the term haram encompasses everything which promotes or leads to harm and is not good for the community. What are those main principles? So basically uh, we have the permissibility of trade. So this is principle, general principle in the Sharia or in the Islamic law, that all types of trades, they are permissible. All types of trades, talking here about the cells, so they are all of them permissible, okay? We have uh, another thing, which is the prohibition of uh, some elements which are prohibited by the Islamic law and must be adhered by Islamic finance, like the prohibition of riba or usury, or interest-based transactions, the prohibition of ambiguity in transactions or what we call gharar, the prohibition of gambling and excessive speculation or maizir in Arabic, and then the prohibition of dealing with harmful commodities. So let's go through them one by one. So the permissibility of trade, uh, basically trading is deemed to be the natural way to deal with each other. So we need it in our daily life okay this is how we can survive how we can basically live with each other as long as there is equity transparency and fairness in transactions and dealings are not in prohibited or undesirable commodities and services so as long as the trading is basically taken into consideration equity transparency fairness in transactions and dealings are not in prohibited and undesirable commodities and services, it is halal basically. So we can use it. So the Sharia puts a lot of emphasis on contracts such as the, uh, that every transaction has to be backed by tradable asset and risks and rewards are shared equitably among the contracting parties. Okay, so these are the main, uh, the main principles that must be followed in order to have a permissible trade or halal trade. So we must observe equity, transparency, fairness in transactions, and dealings are not in prohibited or undesirable commodities and services. So as long as we uh, observe this, trading is permissible, okay? Let's move to the prohibited elements, which are put also as a principles by Islam in order for the financing to be halal, okay? Uh, one of them is, or the main one is, the prohibition of 
usury and interest-based transactions, or what is it known in Arabic as riba. So the contracts where one party is unjustly enriched at the expense of the other party are basically forbidden, and the lender is not involved in any productive activity and does not bear any risk to justify the extra compensation in the form of interest, since the loan is backed by collateral. So usury and interest are thus seen as unfair and a form of economic exploitation. There are two main types of uh, riba, uh, which are riba duyun, and which is the interest from loans, and riba al -buyur. Is there any question so far? So uh, this kind of, uh, these types of riba, let's go through them uh, one by one uh, to make them clear. So the first one, which is known actually to every one of us, uh, which is called riba duyur, which is the interest on, from loans or debts, okay? So basically this, is, uh, this refers to the interest amount in a loan transaction which a lender receives over and above the principal. Okay, when okay, here- Someone uh, uh, just asked, uh, can you explain the softness, please, doctor? You can I didn't hear the question. Can, can you repeat it, please? Can you explain the softness, softness in the chat group, you can see. Before you mentioned the softness. Did you see in the uh, chat? Yeah. Okay, let me go back. Softaja, you mean? Yeah, softaja. Yeah. Is it this one? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, softaja is basically an instrument, as we have mentioned, uh, where, for example, someone. Uh, so we know that in the past we didn't have that this kind of sophisticated yani, transportation means, which we have now, like planes and um, you know trains and so on. So the people they used to travel with basically very simple means like animals. And they used to be, uh, in uh, many cases, they used to be kidnapped, for example, and you know, they used, their wealth used to be taken and so on and so forth. So basically the suftaja used to be used as a kind of instrument. So where the person who is in the, his original uh, land, for example, he will give the money in his land, let's say in a city where he is living, or a village. And then because he is traveling, so he is worried that his money might be you know, taken on the way or he might lose it and so on. So what he will do, he will get kind of like a paper or a check, which is uh, basically documenting that he has paid that money in his place and he is supposed to receive it when he arrives at, uh, at his destination, okay? So he will just present that uh, paper, which is uh, actually a document to prove that he has paid that money. And then he, he will be able to receive actually the money when he arrives at his destination. I hope that uh, it is clear. I think it should be clear, uh, Sister Sumaya asked, yeah, I think yes, yes. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay, is there any other question? Uh, no, doctor, you can continue, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, we stopped here, isn't it? At the types of riba. So we mentioned that <clears throat> the first type of riba, which is basically the common one, and also it is the one which is practiced also by the, the banks. I mean, I'm talking about the conventional banks. So here, for example, if the borrower, for example, fails to pay on time, so the lender levies additional interest, okay? And this is what is practiced in the bank. Sometimes this kind of interest, it is either conditional from the beginning, means at the time of the inception of the debt, or it can be also at the end when, for example, the borrower fails to pay on time, okay? If he cannot pay on time, so for example, the lender will tell him, okay, I can extend the time, but you must pay, 
extra money. Okay, it might not be necessarily um, condition in the beginning of the loan, but it could be also uh, later in the case of the failure of the borrower to pay on time. Okay, <clears throat> so in this transaction, money begets money and no specific activity is performed by the lender to justify the excess compensation. And this is definitely unfair to the borrower. And this is similar, as we have mentioned, to the interest-based loans offered by the banks and other financial institutions. This type of interest was also banned in early teachings of Christianity and also Judaism. Okay, and it is still actually prohibited in those religions as well. And also, of course, for us, yani, it is very clear in, <clears throat> in the, and this is this kind of riba, it is called the riba al-Quran because it is pre, uh, prohibited by uh, many verses in the Quran, especially in Surah Al-Baqarah. <clears throat> we have another type of, uh, uh, basically, as we have mentioned, uh, the second type of um, riba is riba al which is basically um, the riba in the sale transactions, basically, okay? The exchange of commodities. So this kind of riba is divided into two types. <clears throat> the first one is, uh, we call it riba al-fadl, okay? Uh, which is the interest from differentiators uh, in exchange transactions. So it is defined as an excess compensation derived from a trading transaction without any counter value justifying the excess. So basically this one arises from the trading of currencies like gold and silver, and also from homogeneous commodities such as wheat, barley, dates, and salt. And uh, during the time of the Prophet Sallam, people would trade commodities of different types, natures, and qualities. Like for example, uh, person A or an individual A would trade five kg of low quality dates for one kg of high quality dates with <clears throat> individual B on spot. So this is what we call riba al-fadl. <clears throat> riba al-nasa is another type of riba al <clears throat> which is kind of riba which is arising from deferment. So here, differ value is uh, one of the uh, means we are talking here about the differ value of one of the two counter values in an exchange of riba we goods of the same genus, like, uh, for example, silver for gold or wheat for salt, for example. Individual A would trade five kg of low quality dates now with uh, individual B on credit. So in an individual and also individual B has to give back to individual A one kg of high quality dates after one day, or one month or one year from the time of the transaction. So the differential in the, in the transaction and the criteria used cannot be properly justified and thus is also unfair to one party. We will see inshallah by examples uh, from this uh, table, which, trying to, which is trying to simplify this kind of uh, riba. So just to mention before that, that this kind of riba is actually prohibited by the sunnah of the Prophet So he put certain conditions in order to exchange this kind of goods, gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, and salt. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned these six items. If the people want to basically transact in them, we have to observe actually certain conditions which we are going to explain them soon. So basically to avoid ribal fadl in the exchange of currency and also ribal nasa, <clears throat> Islam has put certain requirements, like for example, Gold needs to be exchanged on the spot and in same also amount, whereas weight can be exchanged for gold without any restriction. So the currencies such as gold and silver and commodities 
such as we barley dates and salt may act as proxies for modern day currencies and commodities. So uh, in the table, as you can see, I don't know whether you can see my um, cousin or not. Can you see it? Yeah. I, I, can you see it, Mubi? Yes, yes. It's, okay. Can, so yeah, for, yeah. yeah. So for example, if we want to exchange gold uh, for gold, okay? You see here we have uh, hand to hand, means must be on spot, okay? As you can see in the explanation down, that means it cannot be accepted on credit base, okay? If we are exchanging gold for gold, it must be on spot and it must be also equal in terms of the quantity, okay? It must be also, it must be on spot and it must be equal, okay? So the quality there is not right. So just uh, to mention that the quality is not right because the quality doesn't affect actually because if we are exchanging the same items for the same one. So we have to actually um, have the same quantity uh, for whatever yani quality it doesn't uh, basically make difference. Okay, and if we are exchanging, for example, gold for silver, the only condition is that they must be on spot because they are two different items, okay? But actually this one, the, the scholars, they divided these uh, items into two categories. The first category, uh, we, they put in the first category gold and silvers because they are used actually as, um, they used to be used as currencies, okay? So if we are exchanging gold for gold, they must be on spot, they must be also equal in terms of quantity. But if we are exchanging gold for silver, then they must be only on spot. The only requ uh, requirement is that they must be exchanged on spot, yani at the same session. If we are exchanging uh, from the same, uh, from the second category, if we are exchanging the items uh, from the uh, second category, for example, weight for weight is also the same that uh, requirements we have to apply. So they must be also on spot. They must be also equal in terms of quantity, okay? Uh, the same thing goes uh, if we are exchanging different items from the same or from the second uh, category. Like for example, we are exchanging, let's say wheat for barley. So the only requirement is that they must be on spot. They must be on spot, okay? And if we are exchanging uh, item, an item from the first category, means gold or silver with any uh, item from the second category, which is, uh, which could be wheat, barley, dates, and salt, here, there is no restriction, okay? There is no restriction, means they can be on spot, they can be deferred, means the exchange of the items can be on spot, and they can be also different, as well as they can be, of course, of different quantity, different quantity. For example, one gram of gold for uh, one, uh, for example, 100 kg of wheat, let's say, okay? So they can be of different quantity and also in different form, whether it is on spot or different, okay? Is there any question here before we move on? I think uh, there are uh, some people raised hand. Yes. Uh, we listen to Dr. Hisham. Uh, Dr. Hisham, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Hisham. Dr. Hisham, are you trying to ask something? Dr. Hisham Ashraf. Okay, I think he's, uh, he's just not responding. Never mind. Okay, there uh, there is a question. Does the quality also have to be same? Uh, no, from... no. That one is a mistake. Sorry, I, I, I should have removed it, actually. I, I had removed it in another slide, but uh, it's still there. Sorry for that. So the quality, as I mentioned, it doesn't... Uh, but you have already that one, yeah. Yeah. 
It doesn't have any impact actually. So the only things is that um, the quantity must be same, okay, for uh, exchanging uh, those items which are basically similar, like gold for gold or silver for silver or wheat for wheat. So they must be uh, same in terms of quantity, but quality, no. Yeah. It doesn't okay. affect. For, for all participants who would like to inform you that, you have to participate from the beginning of the session till the end. Because if you want to have certificates at the end, uh, upon registration in our website link, uh, we normally justify your, your participation through your participation and attendance through this Zoom link and Zoom platform. We see, uh, did you join from the beginning to the end or not? If you are not joining from the beginning to the end, you will not be uh, qualified to receive the certificate. So that's why we inform you that uh, don't miss any session and you need to attend from the beginning till the end because we have a committee to justify and to see who is joining from the beginning to the end uh, so that it is gonna be easy to uh, provide certificates to you. Number two uh, information is, Please, if you don't understand any term, anything, just go and ask the, our instructor, uh, because this is a workshop and training, you need to know everything that uh, our Dr. Sharif is uh, trying to uh, you know, explain for us. So don't miss this uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, can they participate with voice or just? Uh... Yeah, can, can, yes. Okay, so yeah, there is someone I think he wants to ask something. Yeah, I think it is still, okay, Manar Mansur, uh, Sister Manar Mansur, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, brother, I, uh, I always had a problem with the, the concept of uh, y yani, um, exchanging, for example, the gold with gold that has to be equal and it has to be it's on the spot. Okay, I understand. Maybe maybe the design is different, for example. But for example, date with date, uh, uh, same, yani, what, what would be the advantage of exchanging? Yani, you understand me? Yeah, yeah. Why would people exchange such things if it's the same and uh, equal? Yeah. Yes. So uh, this was actually prohibited also by uh, one of the prophets hadith, where one of the Sahabi basically he went and then he exchanged his uh, basically um, low quality dates with high quality dates, two for one. And then when he came to the Prophet, ﷺ, he asked him, Is uh, all these dates are uh, good in this, I mean, in this quality, and they have this high quality. And then that Sahabi said that, um, no, we uh, exchange two for one. Okay. And then the Professor said, he said, uh, he instructed him that he has to buy, he has to sell his low quality date and then get the money and then buy the high quality dates if he wish. Okay. So this one basically is, uh, uh, this is a good question, which we always uh, basically receive from the people. Why would people go for actually exchanging, um, you know? Uh, but as I mentioned, the quality doesn't basically affect the, basically this uh, transaction. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, the quality doesn't justify uh, to exchange the same goods with different, basically quantity, okay, it must be the same quantity if you were to do so. If you want to get, for example, something which is high quality, then you have to uh, sell the low quality which you have uh, of goods which you have. And then uh, instead you get or you buy the high quality, for example, goods which you are yani, uh, taking for. Yani, does that mean that yani, yani, the, the Shara wants us to, to be fair? The, yeah, is of that course, the it's to be fair because because uh, this one basically um, it creates some kind of because how do we uh, know that okay this is for example uh, this might create some kind of uncertainty also because how do we know that that one uh, high quality uh, for example of goods uh, is equal to that two for example kg from 
uh, low quality of that kind of uh, you know goods. So mm. the the best is that to sell the low quality one which you have and then uh, get the money and then you buy the high quality one. Okay, sounds very good. And yeah. uh, and the gold, uh, it has to be the same amount with the with you know, gold is like money. So same amount yes, at the same yes. spot. So what's the gain here? Yeah, so this is also to avoid, for example, using gold and silver as uh, basically as a, because they used to be used as a currencies, okay, gold and mm -hmm. silver, so not to be used actually as a, as goods, okay, and then people start trading in both with, uh, and also this one can be used, uh, can also cause uh, what we call riba and nasa. Uh, Riban Nasa, as we have mentioned in the definition earlier, let me go back so that uh, we can get that. Okay, Riban Nasa, which is basically arising from deferment. So the prohibition, actually one of the reasons is of prohibiting exchanging those goods also uh, with a different quantity is that uh, also to avoid Riba and Nasa, which is Riba arising from deferment, because sometimes the one may for example, borrow in gold and then pay later in silver means with high uh, means with the, also with different payment. Okay, which is also and of course with excess because when they are different, as we have mentioned, we can of course uh, exchange them for different quantities, isn't it? So therefore, also it is not allowed. Gold for gold and silver for silver. We must follow the uh, requirements by the Sharia in uh, exchanging them. And also this applies to the currencies, of course. Uh, the currencies also, we apply to them this kind of uh, requirements. For example, if we are exchanging uh, the Kuwaiti dinar with uh, Kuwaiti dinar, of course, they must be the same. And if we are exchanging it for with, let's say, US dollar, then the requirement must be, they must be exchanged on spot. Okay. Because the different day will, um, it might have a yes. different value, so there will be injustice. Yes, yeah, definitely. This is all; they're all very clear. Only like only the the, the gold, you know, Why would we do that? But what you're saying is that because because it's money and it has to be the same, so that we, we don't use it as a yeah as, as a commodity. A... Okay, barakallah fiik. Shukran okay, Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Manar, uh, for your question. Okay, Doctor. Any other question? I think, yeah, there are uh, three, what is the bo best book uh, in Islamic finance to read? I think you should have asked it at the end of the lecture. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? If we, we have, uh, I think, no, no, Doctor, you just, you can continue, please. Yeah. Okay, I think we have a question. What is the difference between riba and interest? Some Islamic scholars are saying that interest is not actual translation of riba. From Arshad, yeah. yeah, please. Yes, so interest is used as a modern basically term for, but of course, riba is broader because as we have mentioned, riba basically cover different uh, types of that excess in uh, either in you know uh, the excess which we have, which we get over the loan or that, or for example on this kind of homogeneous commodities. Okay, uh, but interest is usually used only for the first type, which is basically the riba on loan. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it is kind of to me the word looks nice as well because it has, it has uh, kind of good impression when you say interest, it has a good impression compared to basically if we use other words. Uh, yes, I think we have Hisham wants to ask something. Dr. Hisham again, uh, I think, yes, Dr. Hisham, we allowed you uh, previously, but... Uh... Yes, doctor. Now you can hear me? Yes, yes. please. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for this valuable lecture. I'm just asking about what the difference between uh, riba and trade. Why? Because I have doubt here 
for example, um, what if a person, he agree on my conditions, I give him money and he's in need of money, then I asked him to give it to me back with interest, with increasing, right? So why it's haram? I'm just helping and he's in need of money, right? And he agree about my conditions, right? Um, and I asked him to give it to me back more than the amount that I give it to him. This is one question. The second, because I have doubt here, as I told you, in trade, um, as you know, if I just uh, bought any item, for example, with Tinder, him. So I, I, I'm buying this item with increase with increasing like 20, right? So why trade in that case is halal and riba is haram. And already there is increasing, there is interest, right? So my question simply means, I think that riba is kind of business, right? So why trade is, is halal? And riba is haram. This is one question. The second is, why riba is haram in Islam? Why riba is haram in Islam? Thank you so much. Okay, welcome. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Uh, yeah, the, for the first question, which is, uh, why riba is haram and trade is halal? And definitely the, the answer is obvious in the, in the trade both parties basically you are you are exchanging you know basically goods is not which is not uh, and uh, each party is taking also some kind of risk in order to so which makes the economy actually working well but when it comes to riba we see that one is given money and he's ensuring to get back money with extra without any efforts, without any efforts, without any productive activity, isn't it? Do you agree with me? Oh, the okay. So he's getting, yeah, extra compens uh, compensations for nothing. Yeah, I mean, there is no productive activity. And if we were to do that, actually, then the economy is not going to work at all. And that's why we find actually those giants uh, who are uh, accumulating wealth basically out of riba, they are actually exploiting others, okay? Because they are doing no work, nothing, no productive activities. They are just giving money, getting money back with excess because money is not yes. a commodity and cannot create money out of nothing. So this is uh, the justification. Sorry? So what about the loans of the bank? Is it haram or halal? Which which bank? Loans of the bank, any bank. Of course, if it is a loan, of course, uh, interest is haram. They cannot take any excess over that. It is haram, as we have explained, actually. So uh, if it is a loan, once you call it a loan, whether it is from uh, an individual or from a bank or from whoever, basically, any excess on that is basically haram, is not allowed. Uh, did I answer your uh, yes. question? So what if I, just... yeah, I'm a trader now, right? And uh, I'm dealing with uh, trade. So if someone is, uh, you know, um, uh, want phone, then I give him phone, right? But he will pay the amount of this price uh, on a um, couple of months, right? For example, mm -hmm. per year or two years, according to the agreement between the two parties, right? So what is the, the increasing amount that is halal, right? For example, is it 20 or 25 or 30? Well, when, when it comes to trade, Actually, there is no, of course, uh, uh, scholars, they have tried to put some kind of limitation when it comes to profit, but actually we don't find any specific 
um, instructions in the Sharia, means in the text, like in the Quran or in the Sunnah, which basically put kind of limitations to the Prophet, as long as it is basically not exploiting others, okay? Or taking advantage of others. So there is no limitation to Prophet, means it should be like, 10%, 1%, 20%, 100%, it depends, okay? So as long as there is no taking advantage of others' needs, for example, there is no limitation. And especially here, here when we are talking about when you have, for example, competition in the market. For example, we have different providers of uh, phones, for example, okay? Different companies, producers of phones. So we have competition. So if, of course, uh, you can't go beyond, uh, if you are selling a phone, you cannot go beyond, for example, uh, your competitor in the market, okay? You try to compete with your, uh, with your, uh, uh, with the market, basically in the price, definitely. So you don't tend to, if you definitely, you don't give a better price than the, what is available in the market, of course, no one is going to buy from you, okay? So when we have a healthy market, means there is a free market, competition and so on. So there is no harm. And if that one will be determined by the market, means the profit is going to be determined by the market and competition and real activities. So we, we can't put, we can't set, for example, a limitation. We say, oh, the profit shouldn't be more than 10 or 20 or 50%, okay? That is going to be determined by the market. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. I think uh, we can continue and after uh, yeah, sure. a few minutes, we will take again some other questions. And also sure. money. Uh, but the, but this one is essential. That's why I was insisting if there are any questions now, on, especially on RIBA, we take yes. them now. Right, right. Because it's something very yeah, special. Everyone, people they everyone, use to... uh, everyone is encouraged to ask a relevant question with the uh, uh, content of the lecture session. Yes. Question. Yeah. So, general is there another question on this? Maybe at the end of the session, we can take some other general questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, if no more questions, we can continue. Okay. So, we have spoken about the first basically prohibited uh, uh, things in in the Sharia, which is riba. So, we are moving towards the second one which is also another thing which is prohibited by the Sharia, which is the prohibition of ambiguity in transactions, or what we call error, which refers to elements in a contract that intend to deceive, cheat, and cause uncertainty. Like our friend just now, um, his name was, sorry, uh, Dr. Hisham. So he was mentioning, for example, you are selling a phone uh, to someone and then you are, saying I'm selling to you a phone. So if you don't specify the phone with in details, then we call this kind of transactions or these transactions will involve ambiguity or uncertainty because we're not sure that which kind of phone because we have uh, plenty of phones in the market, okay? Different brands, different you know specifications and so on. So uh, it may here, uh, of course, it will involve ambiguity in the transaction, which is not allowed in the Sharia. So in order to protect the rights of parties engaging in a contract, Sharia forbids in a sad transaction contract that contains elements which are uncertain and ambi ambiguous and may ultimately lead to dispute between the contracting parties. Okay. Is there any question here before we move to the next element, prohibited element. Another prohibited element is actually gambling and excessive speculation or what we call maysir. So maysir or speculation refers to actions whereby an individual engages in excessive risk taking and expects a windfall gain based on chance. And this is similar to gambling whereby no productive activities is involved and also a person makes gains at the expense of others, at the expense of others. So there is merely a transfer of wealth from one party to another without any counter value involved. And this is considered to be also immoral. 
and does not benefit the society. Another prohibited element is basically dealing with harmful commodities. And this is one of the uh, one of the aim of the Sharia is basically to promote a society whereby people are of sound mind, sound body, and sound morals. So anything which is potentially harmful to the society is to be avoided. Like for example, intoxicants, alcohol, pornography, and weapons, among others. So we cannot Sharia doesn't allow to trade in these kind of elements because they are harmful to the society. Is there any question here before we move on? So these are basically the uh, prohibited elements. If we avoid these kind of prohibited elements, then all types of trades are allowed basically. So if we avoid, uh, as we have mentioned, uh, RIBA or interest-based transactions, if we avoid ambiguity in transactions, if we avoid gambling and excessive speculations and dealing with har uh, the harmful commodities, then we can trade as we wish, basically, okay? So you see, all types of trades, they are basically in the Sharia, they are allowed, except these few, very few, basically, elements that we must avoid, which basically, they are causing harm to the society, okay? Yeah. And they are causing basically unfair, also and creating unfair and exploiting one each other in the society. So other than that, we can trade as we wish with each other. Is there any other question? I think uh, my no. There is a question. Uh, does this time banks of our time are not mixed with the river and its transactions? Uh, again, what's the question? Uh, my uh, is does the Islamic bank of our time, I mean currently, are not mm -hmm. mixed with the riba and its transactions? <laughs> General question, yeah. Yeah. Would you have Islamic banks in our countries? Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, we 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 can generalize, of course, yani, to say that. Mashallah, all the Islamic banks activities, they are you know, perfect and so on. There are, of course, a lot of transactions which are uh, uh, basically some or uh, a lot of scholars also, they, they, they don't allow them. Like, for example, you find that the use of Tawarruq and Bayulayna, this is basically uh, this kind of transactions. They are not allowed by the Sharia, even though some few very few of those Sharia scholars, they allow them, but most of the Sharia scholars, they don't allow them, at least those that are practiced by the, uh, I'm talking about the applications of the Islamic banks, okay? So we cannot say that uh, the, the applications of Islamic banks, they are perfect, but definitely, I and mean, there are some applications we, which are disputable, they are not uh, in line with the Sharia, and that one, we have to look at them uh, on the individual basis, especially in the countries where they don't have that really strong governance framework, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, the applications might differ from one institution to another. Yeah, but unfortunately, in some practices, uh, there are kind of, kind of standardized yeah, applications which are not in line with the Sharia, even though some of those Sharia scholars, they don't, uh, or they allow them, okay, like Tawarruq and so on. Is there any other question? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, from Ismail Adeshula, let's listen to Ismail. Brother Ismail, welcome. Brother yes. Ismail. Uh, All right. okay. Alaikum salam. I'm very grateful for the wonderful lecture that you have been doing since. Please, when you was mentioning something relating to guru, al guru before, can we cut to I think you can hear me, sir. Sorry, can you repeat your question? I said, can you clearly, can you hear me clearly, sir? Uh, what are you mean, isn't it? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, Goror. I'm saying something about Goror. Yeah. So Goror yeah. basically is when you are exchanging, uh, I mean, or you are entering into a contract where some of the elements, they are not clear. Okay. And the purpose of them, uh, basically, sometimes people, they do it intentionally, is to deceive or cheat other, uh, the other party in the contract. Okay. For example, as we have mentioned, uh, like, for example, you're selling a phone. If I'm selling to you a phone and I'm saying to you, okay, uh, brother yes, Ismail, I'm selling to you a phone, and then you don't know which phone is that, for 1,000, let's say. I say to you, for 1,000 US dollar. I'm selling to you a phone for 1,000 US dollar. And here I don't specify which type of phone, what are the specification of the phone. For example, even if I tell you, for example, I'm selling to you an iPhone phone, let's say. Still, there is here ambiguity. We don't know which iPhone. There are a lot of series of iPhone, isn't it? Yes. So this might create, of course, definitely will create ambiguity. So uh, which is not allowed by the Sharia because this will create uh, or cause uh, basically later on dispute because you might think, okay, I'm selling to you the latest iPhone, but I'm selling to you, I turn out selling to you, for example, I don't know, uh, iPhone 6, let's say, or 5. And then we start arguing. No, I am paying for this phone. I thought I'm paying for this phone. And then I say to you, no, I say to you this phone. So this will create kind of dispute and also among the parties, which is not, uh, which is the reason why the Sharia doesn't allow uh, ambiguity or prohibits ambiguity. Okay. Now my question, the, the goal is very clear to me on your explanation. But mm -hmm. regarding to the online businesses, regarding maybe we are talking about cryptocurrency and the others or and, and the likes, can we also count that ones as also Goro? Uh, again? Yeah. I said, I will, the Goro, as you've explained, is very clear. Mm -hmm. But why we are relating with online businesses regarding cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the likes. Can we also count that one that we have something relating to Goron in that one also? Okay. So Bitcoin, for example, until now, we don't have clear, uh, let's say, resolutions from the scholars that it is basically halal, just to share with you. As far as I know, until now, there is no decisions from the scholars that it is halal because of uh, so many reasons of course so this is one and of course uh, when we talk about like especially bitcoin and so on so we don't know what we are buying basically yani, until now we still do not know what what does it represent yani, this bitcoin okay it is not yes. representing anything there is no and it is not backed by anything yeah, no, any contribution yes. of these scholars, yeah. yeah. And if you can see, for example, that on daily basis, we we hear, we read, but uh, I mean, in the news that people, how much they are losing of their money uh, because they are investing, of course, in Bitcoin. And out of nothing, they are losing their money. What are they buying? You don't know what they are buying. This is the question. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ismail. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Uh, we just uh, inform you, uh, we do have one hour left from the session. So okay. you may uh, proceed uh, based on your uh, materials and the time <laughs> so that we can sure. complete, inshallah. Inshallah. <clears throat> okay, so here we are still talking about the features of Islamic finance, which are derived basically from the Sharia, okay? So basically the Sharia principles they have, uh, or have been translated into four main pillars deemed to be the main features of Islamic finance. And this is what makes it also different from the conventional finance. <clears throat> so together, these, kind, uh, these principles, they promote sustainability and look after the interests of all the stakeholders as well as the end result of all transactions. So the first one is, the Sharia principles consistent with basically universal values as well, uh, <clears throat> which consist of that those principles are 
the they must be asset backed okay and just now we were talking about bitcoin which is not backed by anything okay so transactions are supported by in the islamic finance should be supported by real assets and services that's why islam doesn't allow to exchange for example gold for gold or for example giving loan and make uh, get an interest on the loan for nothing because and it doesn't create any value in the economy and it is exploiting the other party also uh, those asset back contributes directly to the growth of the real economy okay this is obvious and also promotes financial stability financial stability also contributes to sustainable development another uh, also essential uh, feature is that and principle is that it must be ethical and here we're talking about the avoidance of an ethical and immoral activities as we have mentioned them early avoidance also of interest rate uh, interest based transactions also the avoidance of gambling and excessive speculation and then promote the, uh, or promotes equity justice and fairness islamic finance also one of its principles is that it is participative here we are talking about the equity based and risk sharing transactions we're talking about transparency regarding risks and profit sharing talking about transactions based on different contractual relationships and we talk about uh, and this participative of course is it promotes entrepreneurship okay uh, also we talk about as a principle about good governance which means to avoid uh, we're talking here about avoidance of uncertainty and ambiguity in contracts and promotes greater which promotes also greater transparency and disclosure and leads to accountability and responsibility and finally promotes the well-being of the society so these are the sharia principles <clears throat> which are in nature also consistent with universal values so that means islamic finance is basically from these principles we can conclude that it is actually suitable for all the human beings it's not only for the muslims okay it's not only for the muslims because it brings justice is there any question here before we move on any question i don't think doctor uh, no relevant question yeah okay okay please why why we're we talking about these principles why do these principles matter basically so definitely the lack of uh, moral compass and value based framework in our dealings and transactions basically contribute events that have jeopardized the sustainability of our society basically and environment and among them that we see them actually in our time we know the increasing gap between the rich and poor so the rich they are and this is also the answer to to brother hisham that we see the rich who are basically lending others with interest they are becoming richer and the poor they are getting poorer and i think you 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 can argue with me on this isn't it and also we have uh, an increase in household debt if you see the numbers it is scary in all the societies now because of the interest okay we see increasing household debt we see increasing and massive yani not only increasing and definitely that will lead to crisis at the end we see also and that definitely which lead to the global financial meltdown we have seen that in 2008 it was clear and it was uh, and everyone was predicting that was supposed to happen last year uh, during corona as well and it happened so and it is and it is still ongoing basically we are still living in the crisis we have also another huge actually impact which is accelerating the climate change also we see the world that it is it became a mess we see also the increasing of insecurity and moral decadence so also becoming widespread as well so this is why 
the methods that we uh, or the principles that we have mentioned just now in the previous slide methods and they are very important actually okay this is why is to actually avoid all these basically uh, crisis that we have in our societies and our time at all levels basically at the environmental level and also at personal individual society and so on level so these should compel us to consider how our actions impact our society our people the world around us and future generations so the principles exposed by islamic finance aim to contribute towards a sustainable society that is based on strong economic uh, fundamentals and moral values and adopting these principles is the first step in changing the way business gets done and in creating a more sustainable world any other question before we move on Uh, if no questions, we can move on. Yeah, we can move on, Doctor. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about the as we as I have mentioned in the beginning that um, Islamic finance system basically has been disrupted by the colonial power in the last and uh, starting of course from the 19th century and it continued until last century or the mid of the last centuries. So we have lost that. Islamic financial system. So now there are attempts to basically, again, revive that kind of system. So uh, let's talk about the contemporary Islamic finance. We have mentioned actually the historical background of basically the Islamic finance system means before the colonial, the colonization of the Muslim world. So now we talk about the uh modern one and when did it start basically or the emergence of islamic finance so this has uh, has started basically in the 1950s could be traced in the 1950s where there was an attempt to establish an islamic bank in the late 1950s in a rural area in pakistan so it was basically a small experimental interest free bank founded by a small number of pious landowners who were prepared to deposit funds without interest rewards. So the, the, the credit was advanced to other poorer uh, landowners for agricultural improvements, and there was no interest charged for the credit, but a small fixed administrative fee was uh, levied to cover the operating costs of the bank. And here, Rodney Wilson was saying about this um, experience that although there was no shortage of borrowers, the depositors tended to view the payments in the institution as a once and for all efforts, and the institution soon ran short of funds. In addition, the depositors took a considerable interest in how their deposits were loaned out and the bank officials enjoyed little autonomy with no new deposits forthcoming and problems over recruitment of bank staff who were unwilling to give up uh, lucrative and secure uh, and secure carriers in city commercial banking for an uncertain uh, venture in the countryside the institution soon founder so unfortunately this uh, experience did not continue because as it was mentioned by uh, rodney wilson that uh, because of the shortage in actually uh, the depositors uh, from the depositor side. So that uh, experience, unfortunately, did not continue. In the 1960s, we find uh, also another experience, which is still until now basically uh, <clears throat> continuing, which is the hedge fund, in, uh, which was established in Malaysia in 1963. And the objective of this uh, fund was to enable the Muslims in Malaysia to save gradually in order to support their expenditure during the Hajj pilgrimage and for other beneficial purposes. And also to enable them to have active and effective participation in investment activities that are permissible in Islam 
through their savings. And lastly, to protect and safeguard the interests and ensuring the welfare of the pilgrims during pilgrimage by providing various facilities and services. So basically this fund was established uh, to basically this, this uh, let's say, people who intends to go to Hajj. So they put a certain amount of money and that kind of money will be invested by the fund, okay? In order to, you know, uh, to make more profit in order for those people in the future to be able to go to the Hajj, okay, to perform Hajj from that, from the money which they have actually deposited in the beginning, okay? So uh, it started its business in 1963 with only 1,281 members and a total deposit of uh, 46,600 uh, ringgit, which is the Malaysian uh, currency. Uh, currency. So the quasi government body now has a membership or account holders of around 9.3 million and deposits of more than 75 billion and net profit of uh, 1,636 uh, million in 2018. So now it's supposed to be more. So it is the country's largest Islamic fund manager with a network of 119 branches with more than 6,000 touch points nationwide. And it also makes its presence globally by operating an official in Jeddah or uh, in Saudi Arabia. So this was one of the successful also experience which we had early in the 1960s. And in the same year, basically there was also another um, experience by it was establishing in Egypt. It is called Mitramar, which was a saving bank also. Uh, so afterwards, we find that the first uh, of such uh, also something similar to this uh, Mitramar uh, saving banks, we find another experience which was established in 1971 in Egypt, which is called Nasser Social Bank. Uh, which is uh, not as profit-oriented institution, but social bank to serve the previously unbanked low-income group. And this was also followed by the establishment of the Islamic Development Bank, which is an uh, intergovernmental institution, which was established in 1975 in Jeddah, with the purpose to foster the economic and social development of its member countries. And by also, uh, <clears throat> In the same year, we find the establishment of the first Islamic commercial bank, which is the Dubai Islamic Bank. Okay, and the success of this uh, actually led to the establishment of a series of uh, such banks elsewhere. And, but actually the uh, Islamic finance industry, or at least Islamic banking, they, they, they got, I mean, they became more popular after the basically the financial crisis in 2008. So we find after that, a lot of banks which have been basically establishing so many countries as we are going to see in the slides later. Is there any question here before we proceed? Uh, are you with me? I think just from Mr. Manar, she just raised her hand, let's listen to her. Yes, sure. Yes, please. Yeah. Assalamu uh, For uh, for uh, the people, the intention of people to uh, open Islamic banks or so-called Islamic banks, because uh, I noticed that even like growingly, uh, a lot of people are considering us a target market, and uh, because people they know that people w want to have Islamic things, so they say that we are providing you Islamic just a frame of Islamic uh, services or banking. Uh, and I noticed that the people, like I, I've been to countries, for example, or maybe should, we shouldn't say which countries, but the people who found the, the, the banks, you see them drinking alcohol and you know, uh, they don't mind any Islamic thing. It's, it's just you know, a commercial thing. So my question you know, is this intention, is it, uh, uh, is it a barrier for 
you know, uh, dealing like that. Whose intention? The people who found these banks, yani, they, 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 they just want to uh, get the money of the of the Muslims who are practicing, yani, so that, you know, they, they consider them just the target market, answered uh, target, uh, you know, uh, uh, segment. And uh, let's provide them something so that we can get their money. You know, like we are just a business uh, uh, opportunity. Like, for example, I will give you an example, brother. Um, in countries like Canada, for example, some Jewish uh, people opened slaughterhouses that what, that they say it's Islamic meat. You know, it's like kosher, uh, not like kosher, but they say it's halal. Halal, yeah. Just because there is there is a segment in the in the market that wants halal, so they open it like this. So they're not even Muslim. So what I'm trying to, you know, maybe if we apply this to the banks, do you think it matters? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very important question, but um, just please note that um, actually in Islam, when it sets basically the principles that we have mentioned early, if anyone who is basically observing those principles and requirements in the transactions, then there is no harm actually to deal with them. We don't care about their intention, of course, okay? Uh, because the intention we can never, uh, yani, to say we cannot enter into the inner intention of the people, each one and each individual to basically uh, assess it. Okay. So we just so look at the governance, yani. Possible. Yeah, we look at whether those transactions they meet the requirements, they are in line with the Sharia principles, and that's it. That's our job. Yani, it's not to go beyond that to the Look at the intention of the people. I'm with you, definitely, Annie. There are, um, whether they are institutions or individuals, they are taking advantage of that. But that one is not, um, we cannot use that as basically, but as you know, or as we know, definitely when you are in the market, you tend to go to the, to look for the best for you, isn't it? If you are a Muslim, of course, you should look for the best for you in terms of meeting the Sharia requirement, and also some other things which might be also uh, looked at, like, for example, the person and so on. So that one, uh, yani, for sure, you can do it as a person. But we cannot say to the people, ah, you have to look at the intention of the people before you deal with them. It's not possible, isn't it? Yeah, so you're and saying, the, the yani, it doesn't matter. The, 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 what matters is the practice, not the intention. Uh, like exactly. Even if they're not good people. Yani, even if they are not Muslim, yani, there is no harm to deal with them, yani, definitely. As long as yani, the transactions that but we how are can we with tell, them, yani, if the governance is correct? Uh, how can we tell if uh, what yani, in, in actuality, uh, they're not making haram halal? Yeah, yani, that one we have to look at, of course, the governance structure. The governance framework, we have to look at that. Yani, definitely the activities, that, that is something which is in our hand that we can basically uh, audit, we can basically examine and so on. But the intention, of course, we cannot, isn't it? Yeah, I understand. But sir, what I meant is that the intention could be you know, just to use the, the Muslim people and take their money. Meanwhile, you know, other Islamic... Uh, <clears throat> definitely, Germany. you see, these people in the market, when they open the banks, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslim, their intention is not basically to, um, I mean, if we look at uh, about the business mentality, so definitely none of them, you find that actually they open those institutions to basically to um, serve you as a, yeah, because you are a Muslim or what, but actually their intention is supposed to be actually to make money for themselves and to make profit whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, yeah, that one is for sure. But what matters here, whether they are actually activities, they are in line with the Sharia or not, this is the most important things that we must look at. But actually anyone who enter into the business, definitely this is their intention is to make money. Whether that money is from Muslims or non-Muslim, it doesn't matter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way I understand, but see, I mean, But of uh, course, the one I mean, which I you are mentioning, yeah. The activities, so, definitely we need experts in that to do that job. For example, to oversee their activities. And we should have also 
legal and governance framework also in place. That one is for sure to ensure that everything is in line with the Sharia and so on. And for sure, but of course, if we find, as you mentioned, if we find that we have alternative means, Muslim alternative who are providing, for example, uh, transactions based on the Sharia, and at the same time, he's a Muslim, of course, definitely we should go for that instead. Yani. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, Mr. Ibrahim. Yes, Mr. Ibrahim Mohammed. Uh, welcome, Mr. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Abdul Samad. Mr. Abdul Samad. Please open your microphone, uh, guys, when you want to speak, because Mr. your microphone is muted. Mr. Abdul Samad is here. We permitted for you. Are you there? I think he's not there. Uh, doctor, yeah, you can continue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is no more question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have been speaking so far about the historical development of the modern Islamic finance uh, system. So we'll speak now about the Islamic financial services industry. So when we talk about the Islamic financial services industry, we talk about the components of this industry. Okay, so we find a lot of components actually in uh, involved in this basically industry. So one of them is basically the, if we start with the legal and also the governance framework, we find kind of setting, uh, standard setting institutions and the international and also at the local level. So we find, for example, at the uh, institutions uh, setting or the accounting standards, we find some of them, they are set in the Sharia standards, some they are set in the operational standards, some they are set in the industry standards. So we find a lot of actually institutions which are doing that. Mainly, for example, just to mention that we have for the uh, accounting and Sharia standards, we have the famous institution, which is the IUV. And uh, I hope that you are aware of that, uh, accounting and uh, auditing. Um, accounting, uh, uh, IUF, uh, accounting and auditing institution uh, for Islamic financial, uh, for Islamic financial institution. And uh, so the, it is set in the accounting and also the Sharia standards. We have also some other bodies which are uh, put in the operational standards and also the industry standards, like for example, IFSB, uh, Islamic Financial Services Board, uh, which is based in Malaysia. The first one, IUF is based in Bahrain. <laughs> And we find also uh, some, uh, of course, regulatory institutions. We, uh, here we're talking about, for example, the central banks. They are putting basically regulatory uh, frameworks for the industry at the local level. We find also securities commissions for the capital market. We find also some Sharia bodies, which are basically mainly in many countries, they are under either the central bank or they are under the securities commissions. We find at the institution level, we find kind of institutions like the Islamic banks, you are aware of that. We find also we have uh, Islamic capital markets. Uh, we have also Takaful and Tri Takaful. Okay, we find also some other non-bank financial institutions like uh, microfinance sector. We have Zakat and Awqaf, we have financing companies, we have leasing companies. And beside that, we find knowledge centers like universities, research institutes, training academic, uh, academies, and so on. So uh, these are basically the components of the Islamic finance uh, industry. Okay. Is there any question here before we proceed? No? So let's talk about the Islamic banking. So actually, uh, if, we, if we would like to talk about all these components, it will take some time. But today, I think we will cover the Islamic banking only. So when we say a bank, what do we mean by a bank? So basically, all of you are aware that a bank is a profit-seeking financial institution, which deals with or in money and credit. 
Here we are talking about the bank in general. So it basically accepts deposits from customers or safekeeping and utilizes those deposits to provide loans to businesses and also the public. So here, the bank, from where do they get their money or income? So there are different ways actually how the banks make profit, okay? One of it is the interest from the loans. So the major portion of the bank's income comes from the spread it earns by borrowing money from depositors at a low interest rate and lending to businesses and the public at a higher interest rate. So the bank does not actively share the risk of its business customers and is only exposed to relatively low credit risks, given that the loans are backed by collaterals and guarantees. Another source of the bank's income is fees and commissions. Fees and commissions are also another major source of bank income. So the bank charges fees and commissions for the number of services it provides to its customers, like for example, checks, direct de uh, debits, uh, letter of credits, among others. Okay. Another, and there are also some other sources uh, of the bank's income, like for example, uh, from the bank's earns uh, income from interest on investment, base of exchange, foreign exchange transactions, among others. Uh, how about the Islamic banks? The Islamic banks basically, or when we mention an Islamic bank, it is still a bank as uh, it is defined early, but there are some differences between the Islamic bank and the uh, conventional bank. So the Islamic bank is a financial institution which provides safekeeping facilities for its customers <coughs> and engages in trading, transactions, equity investments, and leasing activities to make profit, okay? While complying with the ethics and values laid down by the Sharia, unlike the traditional bank transactions with an Islamic bank do not involve interest and have to abide by strict ethical and moral consideration, okay? So this is the main difference between the, so supposedly the Islamic banks should uh, basically enter into real transactions, means are we talking about uh, sale transactions or tra trading transactions and equity investments and also leasing activities and so on to make profit. The Islamic banks cannot, for example, give out loans with interest because it is not allowed by the Sharia. Okay. Uh, and inshallah, if we have time, we will speak about, uh, and definitely we'll speak about some of the contracts which are used by the Islamic banks. And I think Dr. Farah also will uh, cover some of them. So, but not today, I think by tomorrow, inshallah. So customers depositing their money into an Islamic bank for safekeeping normally do so for a custodial fee and are not entitled to any predetermined return arising, arising from the use of their deposits by the bank. So if it happened to you guys, you go to the bank, Islamic bank, and you put your money there and then the bank promised to give you something extra over your deposit, that means it is not according to the Sharia, it is not halal, it is interest, okay? So one of the ways which Islamic banks earn their income is through trading transactions, whereby the bank buys an asset at a price, let's say at 20,000 USD from a vendor and after taking possession of the asset, sells the asset at a profit to customers. Okay, so here is just a small comparison between the traditional and also the Islamic banks. So the traditional bank and the Islamic bank operate on different business models. This is the main difference between the two and have different relationships with their customers. Okay, So they are also guided by different motives and frameworks. Uh, for example, here, uh, when it comes to the income and also uh, the moral values, for example, uh, in a traditional bank, we find that um, they have interest-based and fee-based uh, kind of income, okay? Uh, as we have seen early, we find kind of entrepreneurial risk borne by the, here it is borne by the customer. 
and also no subject to any ethical or moral framework. And uh, the relationship between the uh, bank and its client is deposit uh, data and creditor and creditor and data. So it's always uh, a credit uh, kind of uh, relationship between the bank and their clients. I'm talking about the conventional banks. When it comes to the Islamic banks, their profit must be, uh, or their income must be profit-based and fee-based. Profit-based means they are entering into uh, trading transactions like sell transactions and so on. And the risk, is shared between the Islamic bank and the customers, means the banks also take certain types of risk and also has to comply with ethical and moral values. And the relationship between the Islamic bank and the customers is either seller and buyer, lesser and lessee, uh, capital provider and entrepreneur, partner, partner, in the case of partnership contract, and trustee and Trust store as well. Okay, so the first the first one, seller and buyer, is in the case of uh, sale contract. Lesser and lesser in the case of the lease contract. The uh, third one is in the case of the mudaraba contract, and followed by the partnership contract, and so on. So this kind of uh, relationship makes the difference between the Islamic banks and the traditional banks any question so far before we proceed uh, no two, question no question i think i think there's uh mr ismail yes. kamil karimov uh, mr kamil karimov please assalamu alaikum alaikum uh, the question is who uh, regulate uh, the sharing of risks uh, between customers and bank, for example, if there is some risk? Who regulates? Yes, how, uh, Yanni, uh, who give, uh, uh, one moment, mm, yes, how it is uh, regulated by bank or uh, customers and bank uh, meet each other and speak about risks, I don't know. Yeah, of course, the bank has to assess and uh, the risks uh, that it's going to take in any of the transactions with the customers or with the clients. So definitely, it's, the bank itself should decide on that. Okay, I, I understand. And uh, one question uh, of before of slides. Uh, is there in the world uh, the organization that regulate? Uh, is it bank halal or haram? Yani one sister said uh, some Jewish people make uh, in the name of halal, but in the uh, in the um, inside of it, it is not uh, halal. But mm -hmm. is there an organization that uh, regulate uh, that uh, make? I don't know. Uh, yeah. announce is it halal or haram yes i agree uh, i understand okay so when it comes to definitely in certain countries uh supposing in all the countries the regulatory framework is issued basically by the uh the regulators as we have mentioned earlier let me go back to um yeah okay to make it clear for you so basically, uh, these regulatory institutions, which are putting the uh, regulatory framework and also the governance framework, okay, which ensure that those institutions that are operating according to that legal framework and also governance framework or the regulatory framework, they are ba basically in line with, okay, uh, or we can call them Islamic banks, let's say, okay. So these are the institutions which ensure that. This is in the uh, most of the countries, especially when we're talking about the Muslim countries where we have basically bodies that are, uh, that are uh, overseeing this industry, okay? So we find here the central bank, they are issuing this kind of, uh, basically they are doing this job, okay? Issuing the regulatory framework and also the governance framework and ensuring that 
these institutions are operating according to the Sharia, means like they have a license, okay? That this is an Islamic bank. We know that it is an Islamic bank. For example, when it comes to like uh, the West or uh, where the Muslims they are minority. So basically there, we may not find this kind of legal framework and governance framework because basically those central banks and so on, they are not Muslim, so it's not their business basically. But they give licenses to the banks to operate. And those banks, what they do, basically they are either hiring kind of uh, what we call them Sharia board that oversee their activities and ensure that their activities is according to the Sharia, okay? And this is one of the ways, actually. And then also they follow certain international standards, like the one which I mentioned, the IOFI standards, okay? The IOFI standards, whether they are Sharia standards or accounting standards. So those banks, for example, they announce that they are following these, these Islamic standards, okay? to ensure that their activities are according to the Sharia. So this is also another way. This is in the case, for example, if in the countries where we uh, or the Muslims are minority and we don't expect that the, uh, <clears throat> those uh, regulators will basically uh, issue uh, frameworks, uh, whether it is a regulatory or governance framework according to the Sharia. I hope that I have answered uh, yeah, your question. Yes, yes, I understand. Thank you very much. And uh, is that mean that uh, if in the some region there is an Islamic bank, uh, in the same time should be regulation uh, institution uh, should yeah, be definitely. made. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, as I mentioned, especially I don't know where are you from, but I can see from your name maybe you are from this Central Asian countries, isn't it? Uh, I'm uh, from, from Russia. Russia, yes, yep. uh, and my region, it, it is Tatarstan. Uh, in some time ago, uh, our president go to, not Putin, uh, in of region president, he go to Dubai and speak about uh, abilities of uh, making Islamic bank in our region. And uh, I don't know, uh, will they make a regulation institution of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Therefore, right. I ask. Yeah, in those countries, for example, like Russia and so on. So yeah, understand that, uh, of course, we don't expect from the Central Bank of Russia to issue, for example, guidelines, I mean, Sharia, uh, which are relevant to Sharia and so on for the Islamic banks. So therefore here, uh, so there are different ways, as I mentioned. One of them is definitely those banks, they should have their own, uh, what we call it Sharia board. It is a kind of committee which is basically approving the activities of the bank. It is saying that the activities of this bank are Sharia compliant, are according to the Sharia. So this is, uh, and also they mention which, for example, framework they are following, for example, or standards. Like let's say, for example, for the Sharia standards, they say, okay, we are following, for example, the IUFI Sharia standards, means their activities are according to those Sharia standards and accounting standards and so on and so forth. So that's the only way. But we, we can't have uh, central uh, regulators like uh, in the case in the other Muslim countries. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Kamil. Tatarstan is a very beautiful state. I have been there once. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smile from... Uh, Mr. Smile. Mr. Smile. No. Yes. Yes. Now, my question is regarding the banking and the Islamic banking and traditional banking, as mentioned, or uh, conventional banks that we have here in our country. Oh, we also, uh, when we were talking about riba before, you mentioned the two types of riba which are the uh, riba tijaro or riba alboyo. Why in our countries here, eh, in our conventional banks here, eh, if anyone save bank, uh, money in the bank, eventually maybe after some months or some year, it may have some interest on that account. 
which we later conclude that the interests are not lawful in Islam for a Muslim to be uh, uh, taken, taken in, in that part. Mm -hmm. Even that amounts, how can we just manage not to make, since we don't have Islamic banking to be very true to it ourselves, we don't have Islamic banking so that we can be relating with it. But that is the confessional banks that we have. At times, they will just deduct our money anyhow without any notification or any reason tangible reason of reducing the money. How can we just manage with these banks and how can we do with it? How are you? So basically, yeah, in the, for example, in the countries where you have the Islamic banks, of course, you as Muslim, you're not allowed to put your money in the conventional banks. And this is one. Uh, okay. The other one in the countries where you don't have, for example, Islamic banks and you are, you know, you must deal with the conventional banks. Like, for example, you are working, your salary must go and if, for example, your institution must pay your salary, not by cash, but they transfer it to your account and so on and so forth. So in that case, if there is any interest, you have to give it out. Okay, you have to give it for charity. Okay. You cannot use it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So about, about buying shares from the so-called conventional banks, People buying shares with them is it also lawful for them buying the shares? No, it is not allowed. Okay, thank you, sir. You're okay. welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, Ms. Kadima. Kadima? Ah, you actually have a jury. Ah, ah, hey, hey. Yeah. Yes, please, please. Alan. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Salaamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Question about one of the banking. If a bank, like we study, you mentioned about gold. Uh, Your voice uh, was cutting. I, uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah, um, we were talking about gold, right? Earlier, you mentioned that gold has to be at the same time and mm -hmm. we have to collect uh, it once we buy it, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, if a bank provides services where we can buy gold online. Yeah. Uh, the payment is done online through the banking services itself. Like, for example, my bank has an app and I buy the gold. Oh. Yes. So is that allowed? Halima, I think your voice is... Uh, can you repeat the question, the last part of the question? I said that if I'm buying uh, gold from the bank, mm -hmm. the a transaction is online. Is that allowed? Yeah, yeah, it's allowed because uh, when you buy uh, through the bank, uh, you see in your account that you have gold, isn't it? Yeah, we see it in our account, but I don't physically collect the gold. Yeah, it means that like it is left as a deposit with the bank. Yes. Yeah, but actually in your account, you have already gold. Yeah, and if you want to, to go to the bank and collect it, you can, isn't it? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. so there is no harm. Uh, what, about, uh, what about purchasing gold online? We make the payment and the gold comes maybe after a day or two or after a few hours. That one, if it is just a matter of delivering, then it is uh, okay. But if it is a matter that delay, which makes difference in the, you know, in the price, because we know that the price of gold is changing, then of course it's not allowed. And if we order a design, a certain design, can we pay the advance payment or should we, do we have to pay afterwards? Uh, again? Um, if I'm ordering gold and they ask us to pay in advance, is that allowed? No. Or do I have to make the payment afterwards? Yeah. Yeah, oh, you, okay. you need to, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Right, yeah, inshallah. Any other question? I think, guys, we are almost uh, out of time. I mean, we are uh, approaching our time. So anyway, so let's go and uh, finish uh, this the remaining part, and then inshallah, if you have questions, so we can open the floor for that. So we're talking here about the Islamic bank, uh, the banking operations. So the, so we're talking about the sources of fund. We're talking about the uses of fund and the distribution, the distribution of returns. Okay, in the Islamic banks. So the sources of funds basically they come from what are deposit, deposits means the deposits of the depositors. It comes also from the Mudaraba deposits. So here in the first one, the deposits are based on safekeeping. Okay. The second one based on Mudaraba. 
inshallah, if we have a chance, we will explain them, uh, inshallah, tomorrow. And then we have, beside that, we have the shareholders fund and how these funds are used or are used. First one is that they are put into general uh, pool and to be invested, uh, especially here we're talking about the Mudaraba. And then they are invested and the bank will get some return uh, on those money. And then we have also kind of specific account E. Okay, this is mainly for basically also the Mudaraba deposits means that the people they are investing their money. Uh, and then we have also uh, yeah, any different specific funds. So this works for uh, either shareholder, uh, shareholders funds or the Mudaraba funds basically. And those basically uh, from where the returns come either by basically uh, investing those monies means the deposits in general pool as we have mentioned or in some specific accounts okay or in some specific accounts so the and then the return is going to be distributed in the case of the general pool between basically depositors and the bank and in the sec, uh, in the the other specific accounts it will be basically uh, distributed between the bank and that's those specific depositors, okay? Because there are some kind of specific depositors which invest a huge amount of money, like the shareholders themselves. Do you have any question here before we move on? Proceed. Okay, so we just because of the time, I think you yeah. have the last sure, sure. finish. Yeah, but... So, how does the Islamic Bank earn uh, profit? So basically, as we have mentioned just now in the slides, so basically either from the use uh, from the use of fund, basically. So we say that the uh, the bank, after getting deposits from the customers, or from uh, from its depositors, so basically it will enter into other transactions with the clients of the banks. Okay, that could be based on different actually. Uh, contracts, which could be like sell contracts like Murabaha, Salam, Isisna, and Ijara, or it could be in partnership contracts like Musharaka and Mudarab as well, or it could be on the fee based services or some other non banking assets. So from here, the bank basically uh, can earn, uh, of course, profit and can make profit from investing those money that are received from the depositors. And then investing it in uh, with other clients means entering into a trade or entering into other types of providing other services as well to its clients. So the sources of funds, as we have mentioned, we have deposits. What they are deposits? We have wakala deposits. What they are deposit is the safekeeping deposits. Wakala is agency deposits. Means the the clients they will deposit the money with with the bank based on the agency and then we have mudaraba uh, deposits as well we have investment sukuk or reserves and we have also the equity so this is just the illustration of the wadiya deposit or the safekeeping uh, deposit so basically you as a client you come to the bank and then you place your uh, deposit in the bank and then the bank will take care of your deposit okay this could be with fee or without fee. Means some banks they are charging actually. If you want to keep your money with them, they ask you to charge uh, or they ask you to pay certain fees for that in order for them to keep your money for a certain period. Okay, so from there also the bank will make kind of uh, profit as well. Um, we will finish with the uh, Islamic financial services industry. Uh, overview means the current uh, status of the Islamic financial services. So basically, uh, this is according to the uh, report by IFSB or the Islamic Financial Services Board. So basically, now the total asset of the Islamic uh, industry is finance industry is 2.7 trillion. So the Islamic banks is representing 
uh, around 68.2 percent of this total basically uh, industry we have islamic capital market which is represented around 30.9 percent and we have uh takaful and retakaful which is a very niche industry as for the growth of the industry so uh, it has been growing by 10.7 percent so the Islamic banks about uh, was growing by 4.3% and the Islamic market by 26.9%. And unfortunately, the TKAP, especially in the last year, it has witnessed a lot of drop. So here is uh, basically just the landscape of the Islamic finance industry uh, globally. So this is also based on a report which is uh, published by from Reuters. So we have around 1,595 Islamic financial institutions, which include banks and uh, and so on, and takaful and retakaful institutions. And they are divided into, or they are uh, represented in 47 countries, okay? Uh, we have, sorry, we have 47 countries with Islamic finance regulation means these are the countries which have already put regulations for specifically for Islamic finance. We have around 1,008 Islamic finance education providers, and we have around 1,235 Sharia scholars representing Islamic financial institutions. We have around 844 Islamic finance events, which have happened. Uh, this is last year, basically. And we have around 2,878 uh, Islamic finance research papers, which have been published, and we have around 1.28 billion CSR fund or social uh, corporate social responsibility funds distributed or disbursed by the Islamic financial institutions. We have around 11,856 news on Islamic finance. So here uh, it's about the Islamic banks, basically. Uh, we have uh, the Islamic bank in total assets around 2,349. Uh, this one is in billion, basically, which represent around 70%. And then we have Sokuk, uh, which is uh, estimated at, uh, which is around, which was around 631 uh, billion, basically, uh, which is, uh, around million, sorry, uh, which represent around 19% of the total share of the industry. And then we have around 178 other uh, billion also, uh, which, are, which comes from other Islamic financial institutions, which represent around 5%. And then we have uh, Islamic funds, which represent around uh, 5%. Uh, which is equal to 154 billion. And then we have, lastly, we have Takaful, which represents only 2% uh, with an amount of 62 billion. Uh, this is just details of these uh, basically uh, industries, which we have mentioned them just now. So you can uh, basically, you can refer to them in the report, just don't want to take uh, much of your time. These are just the details which I've mentioned just now. So I think, Doctor, we can. Uh, yes, Doctor. If, um, Thank you very much uh, for your resourceful and insightful, informative uh, with data. MashaAllah, it was a great and very excellent presentation and interactive sessions as we tried our best to make it interactive session uh, with the participants. Uh, so that's why this is the uh, a training session from Islamic Economics Association we conducted. So we thank you very much. And I think there is uh, no more question uh, to be taken because tomorrow also we do have another session with Dr. Sharif. Sure. Uh, with the same time, we are going to start uh, tomorrow morning, 9.30 quit time. We are going to start. Oh. 
and uh, and it's in, in in bangladesh time is 12:30 bangladesh time because i can see uh, most uh, some of the participants in malaysian time i can say it's about 2:30 tomorrow uh, pm so dr sharif tomorrow will uh, we'll talk about financing products of uh, islamic banking as well number sure. one so and today we do have another session uh, evening session we are going to start at 4 pm with time 4 pm and uh, uh, 7 pm bangladesh time 9 pm malaysian time so sure, you so. to uh, join our second session uh, today's evening which will be conducted by dr muhammad farooq abdullah so we thank all the participants on behalf of the Islamic Economics Association. And we thank our uh, Director General, Dr. Alan Arbeit, and all the staff members in the association for their effort, for their hard work. And our special thanks to our instructor, our speaker, uh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif al Amri for uh, his time and effort. Nasarullah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yataqabbala minnu hadhi al-juhud al-mubaraka wa ayyuthkila bi'afi minnu hadhi al-dharain. Doctor, if you have any uh, last or concluding... Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really happy to, to be with you all. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for organizing this such wonderful uh, event to share actually uh, some of what we know, at least to increase actually the awareness. I'm a, and the beauty is that uh, we have participants from different parts of the world. This is something very actually encouraging. So, so I'm pleased to be with you guys. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Inshallah, hope to see you tomorrow. Inshallah. Most I'll welcome. be happy also to receive your questions if you have any. Yeah. Zaykum la khairan. Barakallahu feekum. And thank you very much for again. And see you again at 4 p.m. with time 4 p.m. today again. Uh, inshallah, with that we conclude our this session here. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum everyone.